Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to the Avexia webinar series. Our topic for tonight is Metabolomics in Clinical Practice, Getting the Full Picture. My name is Christopher Chu. I am the Director of Marketing for Avexia Diagnostics and will be your host for this evening. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of being joined by an exciting guest, Dr. Betsy Redman, who will be our presenter for this webinar. Dr. Redman is a private practice nutritionist and edu an education specialist who uses a systems biology approach in diagnosing and treating nutritional issues. She is both conventionally trained with a master's degree in clinical nutrition from Emory University and a doctorate in nutrition from the University of Georgia. Dr. Redman has over 15 years of experience in functional laboratory research and education, as well as involvement with dietitians in integrative and functional medicine. She provides nutrition assessment and education workshops in her private practice and works in education at Diagnostic Solutions. Before working in functional medicine, Dr. Redman worked in university research and public health programs. Joining Dr. Redmond tonight will be Dr. Wayne Sedano, our Director of Clinical Support and Education at Avexia Diagnostics. Additionally, Dr. Sedano is the Director of Integrative Medicine Education for the College of Integrative Medicine and lectures and teaches internationally. Before we begin, just a bit of housekeeping. We encourage participation. So if you have a question, you may submit that question in the questions fields in the right hand area of the interface. We will answer submitted questions towards the end of the presentation. If your questions are not answered this evening, you will surely receive an answer by email within a day or two. Without further delay, I will now turn the webinar over to Dr. Redman. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so it, metabolomics and clinical practice. So getting most of the full picture. Um, so I think that along with the um, webinar is the uh, like case study that I had um, submitted to. So that probably ha helps. I thought it would be helpful to go over a case. So metabolomics just is kind of kind of a new and upcoming field. Um, it, the markers can be used for predictive biomarkers, like who's gonna benefit from what treatment. They can use prognostic. How, how can you look at a pattern and identify something's happening? So, and then again, they can use also for pharma, pharmacodynamics, um, so just for medication. So I'm gonna go over a case example, a 50 year old, 58 year old female, she came in and it's, it's based on, um, you know, a client that came in, uh, wants to see her metabolic status, kind of a health check. She feels okay, sometimes tired. She's had issues with depression. She has family history of blood sugar, diabetes, heart disease. Her diet's not great. It's pretty standard. Um, she doesn't eat breakfast, so she eats mostly late in the day. And her standard labs aren't that great. So the area of, of focus are, you know, that I look at the same areas of focus that are on the um, OMX report. So I'm looking at metabolic processing. I'm looking at the amino acid metabolism, uh, nutrition, stress and mood. Some of those are repeats, toxic impacts, and then all the metabolites of the microbiome. And then I also look for patterns of disease. I often do that first, but I'm going to cover it last here. Um, so we'll just start with glycolysis. So with the glycolysis panel, we're looking at lactic acid, pyruvic acid, alanine, um, and glucose. So we look at all these together because they all interrelate. So when glucose comes in, pyruvate can go to lactic acid, it can go into the Krebs cycle, or it can go over to alanine. So I, they, they have all been noted as important in the whole glycolysis pathway. So when we look at her marker, we see that her glucose, her glucose is, you know, it's in within range. So this glucose is just what's going to be in the urine in a standard healthy population. So our reference ranges were set on a healthy population. So a lot of those we just purchased to have qualified healthy people. Um, so this is 
even that 15.2 is you know more of a healthy population i think the highest we've ever seen it is a thousand um, the way we list the tests so we list the markers the glucose pyruvic acid lactic acid alanine pyruvic acid same as pyru pyruvate but below it is the enzyme that's that is going to move them on so pyruvic acid is dependent on pyruvate dehydrogenase so each of the markers has an enzyme below them and that's the one that um, they're dependent on and then nutrient cofactors so we can see that all of hers are high the, all three of these so i'm going to suspect that there's some kind of glycolysis issue related here um, so when i'm looking at increased pyruvic acid um, it's been associated with increased glucose uptake. It's also been associated with impairment like or inadequate amounts of some of the nutrient cofactors. So pyruvate normally comes into the cell and goes um, to acetyl-CoA and it does that with PDH, with pyruvate dehydrogenase, and it's dependent on those B complexes. So it can come in there. It can also go over to oxaloacetate, the OAA, and go into the Krebs cycle or leave the Krebs cycle and go back um, to make glucose. And that's dependent on biotin and magnesium. So when that's elevated, I'm, it, it has been associated with increased glucose um, and that's blood glucose. And then the lactic acid, it's also elevated. There's some great studies looking at urine and, al and alanine um, lactic acid i mean lactic acid in urine yeah so when when lactic acid and alanine are both elevated they've been associated with increased fasting glucose and insulin resistance so that's three markers that's kind of looking at that impaired glycolysis lactic acid um, has also been shown to be lowered by using you know b1 coq10 lipoic acid biotin alcohol intake um, can impact it. And then some diseases like irritable bowel, kidney diseases. Um, when glycolysis flows into the Krebs cycle, so we can see what's going on with the Krebs cycle. Her Krebs cycle doesn't look bad. Um, most things are within range except for the succinic acid. So when we're looking at succinic acid, it's um, closely related to the electron transport. So we think about um, uh, CoQ10, but most of the markers look in range. Um, citric acid, normally we're mostly concerned about low being related to kidney stones, but it's not as, it's not, that's still pretty, you know, an adequate amount. Um, there's actually a new uh, weight loss supplement I've seen that's, it's FDA approved. It's got cellulose and citric acid in it because an elevated citric acid is associated with a intake of a plant-based diet. Another thing I look at when I look at the citric acid is inflammation um, can impact the aconitase enzyme. And so sometimes if cis aconitic acid is elevated and there's inflammation, that can be why. Inflammation also can impact that succinic um, dehydrogenase enzyme. But overall, this doesn't, this doesn't look bad. So I think it's important when you look at the Krebs cycle to kind of look at all the functions that are going on and where it's coming in. Um, I've read some researchers note that alpha ketoglutarate or alpha ketoglutaric acid are associated is um, like with the kind of the the gatekeeper of the whole Krebs cycle. It kind of sets the the tone um, and likely because so much comes in there. And here you can see how succinic acid is associated so closely with the electron transport and why CoQ10 may be helpful if it's elevated. So the next thing that we look at is um, on the test is fatty acid oxidation. So the fatty acid oxidation um, is looking at several markers. So it's more than you might be used to looking at. And I will say, if you're used to looking at other organic acid tests, we have pretty much everything that other tests have it's just kind of laid out in a different format so we look at four dicarboxylic acids we look at three um, acyl glycines and then we look at the branch chain dicarboxylic acids so these all look fine she doesn't seem to be having any issues and then the ketones are low so um that looks pretty good when we look at um this all together in this section. We're looking at the glycolysis, 
coming down to pyruvate, pyruvate going to acetyl-CoA, beta oxidation. So the breakdown of all those fats also goes to acetyl-CoA. It either goes to the TCA Krebs cycle or is, is stored as um, fat in fatty acid synthesis. So this is a nice way to look at the breakdown of the fatty acids. So long chain fatty acids, we know need carnitine to come in. So they come into the cell with carnitine. They're, most of the short, the, the medium and short kind of just diffuse in. But when they go through beta oxidation, they have to go you know, around and around. And so every time they go around, they knock off two carbons and that goes to acetyl-CoA that goes to the Krebs cycle. Depending on their length depends on the enzyme they use. So the long ones that come in use very long, um, very long chain acyl dehydrogenase enzymes. As they get shorter, they have to use the medium chain acyl dehydrogenase enzyme. If the medium chain is impaired, the subacic, subaric, and adipic can build up, and so can those other glycines. If the short chain acyl dehydrogenase is impaired, methyl succinic acid and ethyl malonic can build up. So these are just some of the things we're looking at if they're elevated. So if the first section is elevated, we're thinking of beta oxidation. If the glycines are elevated, they're generally minor metabolites, but they also can be impaired with medium chain, um, ACL dehydrogenase deficiencies. We think of B2 and carnitine because the system depends on those. Um, the ethyl malonic and the methyl succinic acids tend to be elevated when there's an impairment of the short chain. So we're looking more at those. We're also, because butyrate's a short chain, so those can impact that whole process. We look at gut, um, and B2 is a big player there. But again, hers were fine. So when we look at the amino acid section, so that's section number two, they, they are listed as the breakdown in their pathway. So if you were to make a chart, you know, pathway chart, that's how these are generally listed. So we see that her phenylalanine and her tyrosine are both elevated. Um, so phenylalanine comes over to tyrosine. If it can't come over to tyrosine, that phenylacetic acid can build up. Um, but it's coming over fine. So it's coming over from, from phenylalanine to tyrosine, getting a lot from diet. Tyrosine goes on to make, um, you know, uh, dopamine, dopa, and epi and norepi. So homovanilic acid is the breakdown product of dopa, and that seems fine. Vandalmilinic acid is the breakdown of epi and norepi. So that's a little elevated. And that can be associated with increased stress, anxiety. So that's something to, to consider. She may have some of that. And then these other markers are also breakdowns from tyrosine, and they look they look fine. So when we're looking at those catecholamines, kind of a big part of the um, phenylalanine, we're seeing that um, phenylalanine goes to tyrosine, and then this is the dopa to dopamine. So if HVA is built up, we're thinking of uh, excess dopamine turned over. If VMA is, is high, we're thinking of increases of norepi and epi. Um, so she's got a little bit of this norepi and epi that's elevated. The next thing we look at is the branch chain amino acids. So we look at the total because a lot of the research is looking at total. So we want to see, you know, we can compare that to research. Um, so we look at individual with the valine, isoleucine, and leucine. And just, I forgot to mention, that little P right next to it, that means it's done in plasma. So you can do it in urine or plasma, but this was is done in plasma. So we're looking at each of the amino, the branch chain amino acid. Valine breaks down to its alpha keto acid, alpha keto isovaleric acid. Um, so each of them has their keto acid in front of them. But the total and each of these branch chain amino acids, she has elevated, which can be related to some metabolic processes. It can be related to B6 issue, and it can be related to diet. So this is just to let you see how this kind of process works. It needs this branch chain amino transferase. Um, for the branch chains to go to the, each of the keto acids. The keto acids need this dehydrogenase complex that needs um, several B vitamins. And when that process goes through, they use alpha-ketoglutarate and make glutamic acid. 
Tryptophan is another marker that we're going to look at. And we're looking at tryptophan, 5-hydroxytryptophan, which is the breakdown of serotonin, kinurinin, the ratio of those kinurinin and tryptophan, and some of those breakdown products. And I think it's easier to see when you have a pathway next to it. So tryptophan can go to down kinurinin pathway to make NAD. So it makes niacin, that's its main pathway. It can also go to serotonin and it goes to the indoles. When there's increased inflammation, it, activate, it activates the IDO act enzyme and that pulls kinurinin down. So if there's a lot of inflammation, you're gonna get low tryptophan. So you're not gonna have enough tryptophan to make serotonin or melatonin. So you have low level of 5-hydroxy acetic acid, and you're gonna have an increase of kinurinin. And then you're gonna have an increase of this KT ratio, that's kinurinin to tryptophan ratio. And that's a marker of inflammation. It's, a, can, uh, it's associated with increased TNF alpha. We also look at hydroxykinurinin, which is the same as 3-hydroxykinurinin, um, xanthernic acid, and these other markers. Hydroxykinurinin and, and xanthernic acid come up when there's a need for B6. Um, this pathway is actually from a neuroscience magazine, and they're showing the ones in red, the hydroxykinurinin and the quinolinic, those are both neurotoxic and the ones in green are neuroprotective. You'll also see that there's a lot of B6 requirements when this pathway is running through. So when these are elevated like this, you're using up a lot of B6. So the kinurinin to tryptophan ratio, it's been associated with higher BMI, obesity, inflammation, uh, AIDS, cancer. So a lot of things that are also related to inflammation, um, you can see with the KT ratio. And there's a lot of big studies. Um, the ratio has also been related to inflammate, inflammaging. So as people age, tryptophan goes down, kinurinin goes up. And the problem with that is then you get less NAD made. So NAD is required all over the body and the, for the metabolism. You get less indoles made by gut bacteria, and those are needed for immunity and metabolism. And you end up with more of these kinurinin metabolites and that can be neurotoxic. So what you want to have is this dietary um, tryptophan coming in. You want a healthy microbiome so they can make these indoles. And then you want good digestion and absorption and low um, inflammation. There's a great study and they found that as people lost weight, which is diet and lifestyle, they, um, the ratio, the kinurinin to tryptophan ratio improved but they also had an increase in B6. And part of that is because that pathway had been pulling everything down and all those enzymes required B6. So if you're not flooding that pathway, you didn't need as much B6. So it's, it's inversely correlated with level of B6. So another pathway that we look at is methionine. So um, methionine, in the first half, we're looking more, if there's an issue there, it may be an issue with methylation. And the bottom half is really looking more at glutathione production. So she had a little bit of elevation with cystothionine, and that's been associated with vitamin deficiencies, B6, B12, and folate. So that's something we can look at when we get to the nutrition page too. She also had several elevated markers in the glutathione um, so cysteine comes into the cell because cysteine can't. Um, so cysteine comes in, it turns into cysteine. So when it's elevated, it can be flooding in there to make glutathione. Um, cysteine goes, meets up with glutamate um, and glycine and makes glutathione. When you make glutathione, you're going to have that alpha hydroxybutyric acid. So that's going to be elevated. You're going to have, and then if you have increased pyroglutamic acid, it means that you're trying to make the glutathione, but then you can't quite make it because you're missing something. So either um, cysteine, like sulfur, or glycine. So that's why when pyroglutamic acid is elevated, generally clinicians will provide um, N acetylcysteine or glycine. So then histine, you can see her histidine markers are fine. You know, a lot of things, you know, there's it's low and high histidine are related to some other things. Um, interestingly, one of the big things histidine does is it goes into the Krebs cycle, it makes glutamic acid, and it needs folic acid for that. So that's where fig glue comes from. 
And if, um, if, if you don't have any folic acid, then the histidine is gonna be very high in the urine, so it's gonna get excreted and it's gonna go low in the blood. And it also can account for some of that anemia because histidine, um, hemoglobin is about 10% histidine. When we look at her threonine glycine serine section, so these are all related together in pathways, and we see that her glycine's really low, and it may account for why she's not able to make um, a lot of glutathione. Glycine depends on th threonine, because it's essential amino acid, to make um, more glycine. So threonine will make glycine. Serine will also go to make glycine because they can interconvert. So both of those sources it would normally look to to make more glycine are missing. Um, so she does have a pretty strong need there for glycine. And then just all the reasons why you would want to support glycine. Um, so, you know, it, it, glycine conjugation, heme production, glutathione, and methylation. So another marker that we, that we generally look at, it's on the test, is uh, lysine metabolism. So lysine can go to make carnitine or it can go down into the um, Krebs cycle. So um, if it pushes down into the um, Krebs cycle, uh, the TCA cycle, it's going to use up some B6 and it's going to, glutaric acid becomes, you know, elevated. So if glutaric acid is elevated, it can be associated with decreased carnitines because you're not going down that pathway. And then um, higher amino adipic acid is associated with significant increased risk of diabetes um, over the next 12 years, and that's from the Framingham Heart Study. They've done a lot of research in metabolomics and pulling stuff out. Low lysine's been associated also with increased anxiety. Um, but hers looks good. Then we look at the proline, the hydroxyproline, so some um, collagen catabolism. So generally we're looking for high here, which is gonna um, be associated with breakdown, but this, these look fine. And then we're gonna look at the glutamine aspartate um, markers. So glutamine goes over to glutamic acid and the ratio of glutamine to glutamate or glut glutamic acid, they're saying, um, has been used in a lot of studies looking at the risk of diabetes or metabolic impairment. And high is better. You want more glutamine and less glutamic acid. And so she doesn't have that. Um, and then, then her asparagine and her spartic acids are fine. Then the next thing we're looking at is um, nutrition. So we're looking at several areas. We're going to look at all the vitamins. So I'm looking at the vitamins first. Um, we, you know, all the, the dehydrogenase enzymes are put together. So you can see if there's a, you know, a need for any of these or all of these nutrients, you would expect to see all these dehydrogenase enzymes impacted and the branch chain, alpha ketoglutarate and pyruvic acid all elevated. So that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case. So it just seems like the pyruvic acid is elevated. I mean, still make sure she's getting those nutrients. We certainly have seen people with these all elevated. Um, her methylmalonic acid, so if that's elevated, we're looking at a need for B12. And so it's a little on the higher side, but it's 14, so it's still pretty far from the 25.9. So it just looks probably a little higher than it is. Folate, we look at uh, formiminoglutamic acid or figlu, and that's fine. And then for B6, we're looking at pyridoxic acid. And so pyridoxic is the catabolic product of B6 that gets excreted in the urine. It represents about 90% of the vitamin B6 species that get excreted and 40 to 60% of the intake. It will, it will respond to supplementation or intake in one to two weeks. So this is below detection limit, so it's low. And then xanthuronic acid is elevated. So xanthuronic acid is a marker that goes up when there's a need for B6. So here's a, a, a nice study. And they looked at each of these markers, and then they looked at them in a steady state, and then they looked at them with just a B6 deficiency. And you see that xanthuronic acid went up, hydroxycanurinin went up, Pinuronic acid and anthrilic acid both went down. So they're not really good assessments, markers of um, 
of B6. And then it, um, women on oral contraceptives, that's what the OC is, had higher um, needs. Oral comp contraceptives plus a tryptophan load and everything went up. Um, so sometimes you'll see um, some places that'll say, can uric acid can identify need for B6, but that's generally if you're doing a tryptophan load and most people aren't gonna do a tryptophan load on their clients. Then we also look at actual dietary intake. So we're looking at this. So her diet looks pretty good. She's getting a little bit of quercetin. So that's a flavonoid. She's got a little bit of tartaric acid. So that's primarily gonna be some from grapes. It can also be for wine. There's a French organization that specifically uses tartaric acid assessment for wine intake. Um, the one methyl carnosine, those are all looking at meat intake and her meat intake, you know, looks fine. She's got a little bit there. Her fructose intake is pretty high. So fructose is looking at, you know, actual fructose intake. It's while well, glucose gets stored and things, fructose can easily overwhelm the system. So um, it's 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 pretty high there. So again, check on her diet. She also, you know, looks like there's glycolysis issues, um, glucose processing issues uh, are consistent throughout. One of the other things that we I did with her was to look at her GI map. So look at her digestion. So her lactase is low. So really, you know, below 200, you start to be concerned um, that there's an issue there. So um, you know. If, if she were closer to 200 and she was a vegan, I might think it's not as big a deal, but the fact that it's 129 is pretty low. She doesn't have any fat um, malabsorption. Um, and then streptococcus, because strep uh, listed that because streptococcus does tend to do better in a more alkaline environment. So I'm thinking of her um, overall um, digestion. So pancreatic insufficiency certainly um, common with, with diabetes or other things. I've seen reports that if it goes, the elastase goes below 50, you should think of endocrine and exocrine function. It can also be impacted by uh, the purple pill. So stress and mood is another area that we look at. Um, so we're looking at all these, some of these are repeats. So we're looking at GABA, which is gonna be higher in mood disorders and that's fine. And then these are the catecholamine turnovers. So we already know she's got some increased epi and norepi turnover. She's got very low um, serotonin turnover. She also has high cortisol. So that's uh, going to be a problem that's related also with anxiety and can helps in the conversion of norepi to epi. So they're just more confirmation with stress and mood in intake. And then we're looking at toxic impact. So with the toxic impacts, her 8-hydroxy is really elevated, and that's a you know marker of DNA methylation. Her toxins are kind of normal, xylene, styrene. So you know they're a little higher than you'd want, but they're normal. Glucaric acid is looking; it's kind of a measure of P450 um, enzymes. So these are just all the things of, that have been related. Um, with increased 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, so oxidative damage to the guanine section of the DNA. These are the toxic inflammation negative impairments that I'm looking at overall um, within the test. So when we look at her urea cycle, it kind of looks okay. The um, arginine is a little low. So low arginine has been related somewhat to um, High blood pressure, because when you have enough arginine, it'll go over and make nitric oxide. Decreased pl plasma arginine has been associated with GFR, and supplementation can has been shown to reduce plasma glucose. Um, also looking at lower citrulline, and again, this is not, it's not technically low, but it has been related when it is low to um, associated with in, impaired enterocyte function and small bowel absorptive capacity but the other markers look fine. So then we're looking at kidney function. So orotic acid's a little elevated and that can identify arginine insufficiency. So that makes sense. We're also looking at micro, microalbumin and that's nice and low. Um, her phosphate intake's a little on the higher side. Creatinine, so we know that the, the test is valid as far as looking at things that are 
um, ration to creatinine. And the oxalic acid, though she doesn't have any real issues with that, is a little bit on the, the higher side. So kind of looking at her dietary intake and making sure she doesn't have any history of kidney stones. The last thing that we're looking at is the um, microbial metabolites. So we're looking at food that comes in and how the microbiome goes after them. So the sacrolytic metabolism is anything for those carbohydrates and fibers. So fibers are going to get broken down by gut bacteria to the short chain fatty acids, acetate, butyrate. Um, the polyphenols are going to be phenolic. Um, metabolites are going to get broken down to 3,4-dihydroxycinnamic um, acid and these other compounds. Estro the phytoestrogens are going to get broken down to equal. The amino acids, phenylalanine tyrosine, one of their big breakdown products is 4-hydroxyphenylacetic acid, and the tryptophans, we're looking at one of those indoles. I did also look at her um, you know, her GI map. So I can see that she does have a little bit of um, you know, leaky gut. So her zonulin is elevated. So all these things are kind of pointing to issues with um, digestion. So when I'm looking at her um, microbial metabolites, it's important because part of it is what you're getting. Are you getting amino acids, polyphenols, isoflavones, but what bacteria are there to process it? So she's a little low on some of those bacteria that are going to process it. So when you're thinking of polyphenols and gut microbiota, they're going to support microbiota, and then the microbiota is going to, are going to act on the polyphenols and give off these compounds so they can give us a little bit of idea of what's going on. So the 3,4-dihydroxycinnamic uh, acid is associated with intake of flavonoids and flavones. The 3,5-dihydroxybenzoic acid is phenylates. It's a, it's a marker of um, whole grain intake. The 4-hydroxybenzoic is a marker of intake of anthocyanins, those purple things. Benzoic acid can come from foods or it's an additive. You really need to query where she's getting it from. She wasn't eating a lot of berries. I'm thinking hers is more from additives. Benzoic acid should always conjugate over to hippurate. So that's a glycine conjugation. Hippurate's been found higher in people who are consuming a Mediterranean diet. Um, so one of the things we also look at was she was an equal producer. So she's either taking a supplement which, and that, or getting some isoflavones. So equal is a superior to all other isoflavones in terms of its antioxidant capacity. So, um, and the spot urine is gonna correlate strongly with serum. So she, she is getting that. And um, that equal production was associated with lower arterial stiffness and uric acid levels and a higher EPA AA in women in their 50s. Um, vegetarians reported higher rates, which, which makes sense. Um, so she did have that. And this is just epidemiologic studies have indicated that increased soy uh, isoflavones can positively correlate to um, a lower incidence of diabetes. So it's good if she's getting that. And then lastly, I wanted to look at the relationship of those patterns. Like what patterns does she have um, that are related to um, her, her disease. So I'm looking at like to dysmetabolism, to prediabetes, obesity, diabetes, fatty liver, those kind of metabolic issues. So I did a genomic insight test on her and I see that she's got increased risk of metabolic sy syndrome. Um, she would benefit from a low fat diet and it's, you know, not just this one. She had some other markers that identified that. And she had risk of coronary artery disease. So this is kind of a compilation and she didn't have all of them, but just having the one she had increased her risk by 110%. So certainly those are things that she should consider um, in looking at her diet and her health. So this is looking at the process for going through um, to diabetes. There's increased reactive um, species, decreased antioxidants and increased oxidative stress which can lead to mitochondrial dysfunction. So we know she has increased oxidative stress. The mitochondrial dysfunction is kind of just starting with that glycolysis. 
um, and that goes down to insulin resistance, hyperglycemia. So she seems like she's on at risk for those. This was a great study um, looking at what you'll see in metabolomics with pre-diabetes and um, type 2 diabetes that gets worse, worsening. So she didn't have this increased beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is increase in ketones. She did have an increased glutamic acid to glutamine ratio. She did have increase in aromatic amino acids and the branch chain amino acids. So branch chain amino acids and aromatic amino acids are useful biomarkers in monitoring early response to therapeutic interventions. Elevated branch chain and reduced glycine have been noted as the most robust and consistent amino acid markers for prediabetes, insulin resistance, and future of diabetes. And that was just from 218. And this just kind of goes over the same things. There's a meta-analysis showing the risk of diabetes and what you're going to see with the markers. There's this meta-analysis of um, 2020 and 46 different articles. So it's pretty conclusive that when you see these branch chain and aromatics elevated along with glutamic acid and alanine and low glycine, that you have higher risk for um, insulin resistance, diabetes, prediabetes. So individuals with the highest scores of amino acids had a twofold higher adjusted risk of developing diabetes over 12 years of follow up. And this is looking at, we're not the only ones, the OMX is a um, range of looking at branch chain amino acids since it's good to look at the total because a lot of the research looks at the total. Mayo looks has similar ranges, LabCorp. This is a research study where they had people lower branch chain amino acids in their diet. They did it in seven days by using, you know, foods that you'd use with inborn errors of metabolism. This is just reiterating that um, increased glutamine to glutamic acid ratio um, and how you want to have increased glutamine and less glutamic acid. They found that in the Framingham, in the PrimeMed, and then some other studies, large studies. So hers is low and you really want it high. And this is uh, just reiterating, looking at the lactic acid and the alanine in urine. So alanine, when it's elevated, whether it's in urine or plasma, it it's, can be associated with increased risk. So there are some support, like results looking at how a Mediterranean diet can help reduce the levels of branch chain amino acids and kind of attenuate that risk for diabetes. So this is what I call my diabetes initials. I wasn't, as a re, if I was, since I wasn't a researcher, I didn't want to call it a signature. But she has all those things, the increased lactic acid, alanine, phenylalanine, tyrosine, branch chain, low glycine, and a low uh, glutamine glutamic acid ratio. So in diabetes patients, those who began a Mediterranean diet with a low baseline branch chain, had a higher probability of diabetes remission. It doesn't mean that if they're elevated, you can't, it just means you're just gonna have to probably work a little harder on it. And that, so if you can catch it before the branch chains are elevated, that's likely a good idea. Um, these diabetes are also associated with um, increased fatty liver. So, I mean, so fatty, um, fatty, non-alcoholic fatty liver, sorry. So when, if you get fat in your liver, it does change the metabolomic processing. It increases pyruvate and glucose and decreases the response of um, ketones. So normally you make more ketones and less pyruvate and glucose, um, but with increased fatty liver, it's the opposite. And this is looking at how the gut dysbiosis has that um, a healthy gut dysbiosis that can make equal is associated with better liver function. So there's also some fatty liver associations that I have here. So she had these also. So these are com compilations for some, from other studies. So she has elevated pyruvic acid, low glycine, low serine, elevated glutamic acid. These markers um, can be impaired in fatty liver. You'd see low glycine and elevated alpha amino adipic acid, low tyrosine, low um, 5-HIA, and normally you'd see low equal, but she's got the benefit of an elevated equal. So um, 
this is a great article and they identified that a metabolic signature that robustly reflects adherence to a metabolic response to a Mediterranean diet and predicts future risk of cardiovascular disease independent of uh, traditional risk factors. So they're looking at a metabolic signature. Um, and, and so it, it was really helpful to them. I think we're not really quite there to their metabolic signature because um, they're Stanford University, I believe. So, um, but we're getting a lot more research coming out so we can kind of see what we might be looking at. So that's my quick wrap up of all that. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you very much. That was very informative. So um, now, um, without further ado, we'll take some questions. Um, if anyone wants to submit questions, I'll just reiterate that you can type them into your questions area on the interface here. Um, and then I will read them uh, to Dr. Redmond. Um, I know Samuel Bart Williams has a question. I don't know if you would like to type that into the uh, questions area. Um, I think maybe they're going to do that now. If not, I can unmute you and you can ask the question directly. Um, it's up to you. Let me see if they're going to. Okay, so I'm going to unmute Samuel Bart Williams. You will have to, let's see, you will have to unmute yourself as well. I think you can, you may ask the yes. question. Yes. Thank you. By the way, I couldn't answer, answer any questions. I think it's uh, disabled. But anyway, oh. my yeah, uh, my question is: Are there any um, markers that indicate uh, levels of vitamin B five? Yeah, for for pantothenic acid. Um, yes. Yeah. So um, there's a couple. I mean, the the main one we're looking at. It's hard to pull it out by itself. I mean, it's certainly related um, with, with glycine conjugation, but it's included with the, um, the dehydrogenase enzymes. So all those dehydrogenase enzymes um, require um, B1, B2, B3, B5, and lipoic acid. So um, the branch chain um, keto acids, when they're elevated, they can identify an impairment with that dehydrogenase, the alpha ketoglutarate glutaric acid and the pyruvic acid. Okay. So they tend to be they tend to go better and um, because it's so ubiquitous, it's hard to get it all by itself. So generally you're going to see it with that grouping. There's a Japanese um, researcher who does a lot of work with looking at um, the B complex vitamins and looking at these dehydrogenase enzymes. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the main one since it is so ubiquitous. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, Dr. Redmond, uh, Dr. Sedano here, just a quick question for you. Uh, in your experience, I know this is a relatively new, new test. What patients would you say, you know, I've got to have this? Do, uh, do you have your patients that you definitely want to have you know, to run this test? Yeah, I mean, it's like any, you know, um, patient that, well, certainly I think it's great for um, metabol like, um, metabolic issues, insulin resistance, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, because we have pulled a lot of that information or pattern or fatty liver that from large population studies like the Framingham or uh, the PriMed study. So they have a lot of ends that they're looking at. Um, I think anybody who has, you know, mood disorders, it's also good. I've had um, people that just got as healthy as they thought they could be. So they, you know, they got, you know, supplements, they were eating great and exercising, and then they wanted to see it. Like if they're doing everything, what is left? Kind of as a check, like what metabolically might impair them? But really anybody could identify because it's looking at, you know, nutrients, it's looking at your, you know, metabolic processing, the breakdown processes of each of the amino acids. So a lot of conditions like that, K, you know, canurinin to tryptophan ratio that, um, you know, it's associated with all sorts of things that are 
um, associated with inflammation. So cognition, inflammation, obesity, renal issues. Thank you. I just because yeah, I just wanted to hone in on where there's you know particular set and it, it seems like it's the, you know classic with the organic acid test that you just you have you know, definitely have to have this thing and I know how powerful it is. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Doctor. And now we have uh, three more questions. I'll start with Karen Wright. She writes, okay. "I thought I thought that the ketogenic diet was beneficial for diabetes, but that raises beta hydroxyburate." butyrate, which I think your slide shows were associated with increased risk of diabetes. The question is, the keto diet, is it beneficial for diabetes? Well, I think that, well, that's a, you know, <laughs> that's probably like a long, a long answer. Um, I think what, they, what they're showing in the research is that when people have impairments in the metabolic processes, oftentimes, um, you, you can have increased ketones. So um, that may just be a metabolic issue. And I think that's separate from if somebody's on a ketogenic diet and they can improve their glucose, they are gonna, you know, in their glucose processing, they may in, in, um, improve the other markers like the increased branch chain amino acids that would be my thought. I haven't seen studies where they um, do a ketogenic diet and look at things like branch chain amino acid levels. So the ketones, you know, are certainly going to come up if you're on a ketogenic diet, but they're part of the um, glucose processing. So they're really just identifying an issue. So it's 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 hard to say. Yeah, it's a roundabout way saying it's it's hard to say. I, I wouldn't just say that if somebody had increased ketones, that's a bad thing. Always, because it could be that they hadn't eaten or they're eating a certain way that may um, actually be beneficial for their overall glucose processing. Okay. Uh, next question was from Lara Sweeney. Sometimes I see branch chain keto acids at different levels. The and I I'm, I apologize. A A KIV K I V and A KIC K I C will be low, but the A K B M will be high. Do you have any yeah. insight into this? Thank you. Yeah, the alpha keto beta methyl valeric acid. Um, that what you meant to say? <laughs> that I, one. I, I butchered that. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, so yeah, that one does tend to run higher. Um, it's and I don't know if having the alpha keto and the beta methyl make it a little harder to read in the um, in the in the, the scope thing, um, but it does tend to run a little bit higher. Um, we off, we'll look at the total keto. That's kind of why we look at the total keto, um, so that we can see that because that that gives you a better idea. But yeah, I have I have noticed that that one runs a little higher, and I'm not I'm not exactly sure why. Okay, okay, thank you for that. And then um, Asia Real uh, asked the question, can this be used to assess a 14-year-old girl with digestive and mental health disorders? I would say yes. I mean, we've gotten several, um, we have a clinician who does the test and um, they primarily see pediatric patients, um, you know, so, and, and they tend to be more adolescents. But yeah, certainly when you're, your first, you know, year of life, organic acids tend to be you know, really high, certainly the first like month. But by the time someone's 14, they, they should have stabilized, you know, to be pretty uh, adult ranges. So I would, I would say, yes, I think you could get a lot of insights. Okay, thank you for that answer. And then uh, finally, Ruby Anjum writes, if a patient can only do either metabolomics or GI map, which one would you prefer? Oh, well, um, I would look like, are they having um, more GI issues? Or, um, you know, then I would probably go with that. Um, but I think that you get more information. So that's, well, yeah, <laughs> I am, you know, partial to the OMX. So 
it, you just get, you know, maybe broader information. They work so well together. I, I guess I would kind of look at the symptoms that they're having. Um, and if they're more GI related, I might go more with that. If they're more um, metabolic or mood or maybe toxic issues, then I would I would move over to, to the uh, OMX test. It does give some idea of um, how uh, GI function is on the section six, which is um, you know microbial metabolites. Okay. Great, thank you for that. And then uh, just a follow-up from um, Asia Rial, mm -hmm. who asked about the 14-year-old uh, uh, female. I already used Great Plains to do organic acids, but is there further training in this test available, or is there help in interpreting these tests? And I don't know if, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Sadan, you also want to chime in on this one. But anyway, I'll leave it at that. Well, I'll, I'll say for, for us, yeah. I mean, we yeah. certainly have um, consultations. We have like a, um, a, a, a guide online. It just kind of says if this marker is high or low, this is what you can, you know, consider. And then we're, you know, we have some webinars and we're constantly getting ready to bring things, more education out. But you can always call us. Right. And also this, I think, leads into the next slide, uh, at Avexia, we offer this Ask the Doctor feature. It's a, a free service available to all our clients um, where you can talk with Dr. Sedano via email, and he's, he's very quick to get back to you uh, with any uh, interpretation-related uh, uh, questions about test results. Um, also, there is a live version for an additional fee that you can set up and schedule uh, th through the portal. Uh, just look under tools and you'll find Ask the Doctor. Uh, Dr. Sano, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, if you're using either one of those services, you have the ability to put in a little bit of the patient history, which makes this go a lot smoother. Uh, so if you do that, you can type in your patient history, environmental toxin exposure, medications, things like that. That's going to help me analyze these tests a lot better. And also on the other end of the spectrum, if you're not sure, you can still put a history in it and you can ask me what, you know, what do you think is the best test for this patient? And I'll need some history. Uh, so it, it's a really good service and a quick turnaround. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for that, doctor. Okay. Uh, Dr. Emma, if you would prefer, uh, uh, proceed to the next uh, slide. So now that we've you know, now that we've learned so much about metabolomics and the OMX test, I would like to review how to order the test before concluding the webinar. Uh, first, you will need to log in to your Avexia account and go to Avexia link. There's a, a button on the left side hand column of the menu. Uh, next, you're going to select to create a patient or to assign it to an existing patient. Uh, then you will uh, select specialty labs, uh, go to the diagnostic solution tab in, in the menu and locate the OMX test. And finally, complete the test order by clicking the green place the order button. It's just that simple. Uh, so so that's that's how you will go order the test if you're interested. Uh, doctor, if you don't mind proceeding to the next slide. Okay, obviously, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we would like you to know that you may contact us by email at info at avexiadiagnostics.com or by phone five days a week at extended hours, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time at 888-852-2723. We also have uh, chat available on the website. Uh, doc, uh, thank you, Dr. Redmond and Dr. Sedano for this informative presentation. A recording of this webinar will be available by email in the next few days. Um, if you wouldn't mind uh, going to the next slide, doctor. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I appreciate that. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you again for joining us for this webinar event. Until next time, from everyone at Avexia Diagnostics and Diagnostic Solution, stay healthy, stay safe, and we wish you all the best on your pathway to wellness. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Redmond, very much appreciated. Thank you.